and um, I loved the concept, I loved the idea of an older man in the condition that he's in, having to deal with aging, having to deal with the loss of his memory, and then having to find a unique and original way to deal with a robot, which is to teach him to be a second story man. And, uh, and I met Jake and, uh, and uh, Ford, their mothers brought them to the table. And, uh, <laughs> what are you saying? I mean, look, look at this. This jacket is older than he is. And, uh, we met in a restaurant called Henry's on 105th and Broadway, which is my lucky restaurant, it's owned by uh, someone I adore, who I've known since he was a little boy, and we sat down, talked about the script. They were wonderfully open, and, and I said, let me tell you things that a 72-year-old man would feel. And they beautifully went away and came back and incorporated all those things. Jay, can you talk a little bit about the process of developing this story? What attracted you to both the sort of futuristic, although near futuristic aspect, but also this character of, of Frank? Um, yeah, uh, the, this actually started as a, as a short film at NYU. Um, Chris Ford, who wrote the script, it was his thesis film at NYU that I, uh, I produced, which means that we shot in my uncle's house in uh, upstate New York. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was very bare bones. It was just, an, an, an even darker than this, it was just an old man dying with a robot. Um, and, and when we were looking around maybe three years ago for something to turn into a feature, I just always loved the image of it. And Ford had the hard task of actually turning that into a feature length idea, um, which I think he did very well. And what about collaborating with uh, the two of you together as collaborators on this project? I mean, how Never that... again. <laughs> You're talking about Ford, are you? <laughs> How does that process work when you when you walk in and uh, you know you're a, a veteran of the stage and screen and you're a first time feature director? I mean, there's got to be a trust that's established, I assume. Do you want to answer that? It's for the first week of shooting. Frank kept a, uh, a very vocal running count. <laughs> first time we just were one. <laughs> That's two wrong, that's three. It got to 68 very quickly, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Actually, I trusted him completely, but I also, I know I gave him a very hard time. I did, it was a very, very difficult shoot. It was about 100 degrees. I forgot the town, we were in Dobbs Ferry. There was no place to sit, no place to be. It was really like putting on a show in the barn, Mickey Rooney time. And um, I was irascible through most of it, sweating, and, this isn't working, Jake. This isn't at all. Oh my God, this is terrible. It's the end of my career. I really was. And it taught me again that the only thing that matters is what happens between action and cut. Anything up to that moment, the audience doesn't have to know, shouldn't know. And uh, you just, the moment action happens, you, you go into a place. And he, he really is a remarkable young man. His, He's the hero of this film, I'm not, because I, all I had to do was think about Frank and try to hold on to him. But Jake had so much, so many pressures, and for a first time filmmaker, it's. You also talk a little bit about your co star in the film. Uh, acting with the robot, and this sort of. Uh, I understand it's a very low budget movie, and. Uh, Oh, <laughs> the no budget movie. <laughs> no budget. Can we talk about uh, the process of working with the robot? How did the uh, decision about the robot come about? What you were going to do and handle that character, and then uh, them together. Yeah, um, you know, the the nice thing is that these robots actually exist like this, but it's a real technology that's being developed. So there's a fair amount of reference out there for for robots that are being designed for this purpose. Uh, we worked with a place called Alterian Effects in Los Angeles. They do all the Dash Punk helmets and uh, all the Farrelly Brothers movies and like weird fat suits. So we thought they'd be like a really good place to combine like a human performer working in, you know, but also being very good at fabrication. And you know, the, the thing that I thought was most important for the robot was that it'd be faceless and that less was more, which is good because it couldn't do much of anything. It could barely climb mm -hmm. the stairs. So uh, it, you know, so much 
onto that robot. And you know, I wanted when it first shows up, I wanted you to be able to feel like it was creepy. You know, because it's creepy to him as this thing invading his life, and then at some point he comes to care about it, and hopefully the audience does too. And I think the the less you have there, you know, it really comes from Frank. It's his relationship with it. You know, that the robot doesn't need to do very much as long as you know you have a great actor interacting with it. You know, he can give it so much of what the audience is supposed to feel about it. Rachel Mott, who had to endure that hundred degree heat in a, in a robot suit, which is no, no easy feat. Oops. Very sexy little girl. <laughs> she was sometimes inside that thing and sometimes she wasn't. Sometimes my nephew, Andy, who I got to play to be just a, a, a gopher on the movie, he read it off camera. Sometimes Jake said a few lines. The robot always changed according to the situation or how long the young lady could stay in it. So uh, for me, in terms of working with the robot, I think I talked to you about this last night. I knew that um, it wasn't going to be ideal ever because sometimes I simply couldn't hear her because she was deep inside that and her voice couldn't project and sometimes she couldn't be. Um, so I created a robot in my head and every time I spoke to it, it was my robot in here. So whatever sound I heard was filtered through what I was thinking that robot was somebody I'd created so I could hang on to that. I have to say, it was a real, I mean, very early on the idea of it being a CG robot. So I was like, no, I don't want the actor to have nothing there to play with. And I wanted it to have freedom of movement, and I wanted her to say the lines, and I wanted her to be an actress also, so that, you know, Frank would have someone to play against. And then it all turned out to be, to watch him, you know, I had this hilarious picture of Frank sitting next to the torso of the robot sitting on an apple box, and he's playing. Do these scenes, you know, whatever was there, I mean, it really seemed to make no difference to the quality of his work. I mean, it's, it's incredible to watch. He, uh, Frank, last, speaking of last night, he mentioned a great story about being cast in this film uh, and finding out about uh, the role I was, and some of the limitations of the robot, perhaps. Maybe you could recount that story. I thought that was a terrific story. One is Christopher Walken. We started together 45 years ago. I saw and I went, oh shit, there's another one out there. I thought I was the only one, you know? And there was this magical actress, I think one of the greatest actors. This part down, and uh, I was sitting with my agent, who was Chris's agent, and the, the email or the technological thing said, Chris is gonna pass, and she called, maybe Sam and Gold, I don't remember, and said, what about Langella, same deal. And they said, okay. That's how it happened. So I called Chris and I said, you know, you turned down this movie, which I think is a very interesting part and a wonderful character. Why? And he said, oh, I didn't think robots could go upstairs. <laughs> That's not how you told it to me. Is it? Oh, no, he's going to And he does a brilliant impression. So, so the way it was explained to me, forgive me if I'm wrong, I also had hilarious meetings with Christopher Walken before he turned this down, but, uh, but his relation to the robot, he said it was a how could a robot be a second story man? <laughs> and, and then after, and on the second floor, yeah. and then doing the scenes, Frank returned to me and he said, you know, this scene is the reason Walker wouldn't do the movie. <laughs> but you guys, Christopher Walken, Christopher Walken was right. Remember when Rachel, the robot, literally, because of the way the suit was built, it could not go upstairs. So he was, he was correcting the day on that one. I have a bet with, I have a bet with Christopher because I took a movie that I eventually could not do for complicated schedules, and then he got that part. So uh, this is a movie that started out with Chris, and he's in a movie that's coming out this year that started out with me. So we have a, a bet to see which one works, but I have a feeling I'm winning. <laughs> from the audience here if we have any before we uh, resign to the downstairs for our party. Uh, did anyone have any questions for anyone on the stage? Yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Langella, you said that you gave the director some feedback on what it's like to be a 70-year-old man. 
curious to know some examples of some things that you mentioned to him that were incorporated into the story. The question is, uh, you mentioned that you gave feedback to Jake regarding what it's like to be a 70-year-old man. Can you talk a little bit about what that feedback was and how it was incorporated? Yeah, I, I just sort of suggested to the two of them when we met that there needed to be um, a, bit, a bit more of what the emotional life of a man who's beginning to face his mortality is like that no 30-year-old can understand because you think at 30 that you're really going to live forever and 20 minutes later you're 70. So I talk a lot about my feelings and what, not that you, I think you have to play yourself in movies, I, I don't. But I wanted them to understand what the resentment of the robot would be. It wouldn't just be irascible and angry. It would be a certain amount of fear and a certain amount of trepidation that you're coming to a time in 